settled in. I've been getting to know Mark since yesterday. I don't know how our paths haven't really crossed. We know a decent amount of the same people, but we never met in person. So I've been talking with him, trying to figure out what to say to accurately introduce him, and he did the best job possible. So I'm gonna highlight a little bit that's in here. He fosters regenerative leadership values, practices, and learning systems for communities and workplaces. So we're gonna hear more about that. Um, he's also been a leader in the International Nature Connection Movement about 30 years. One of the coolest things about Mark, and what I always find remarkable in people, especially educators, because we're educators ourselves, and we're around a lot of other educators, is I've heard him say, I don't know a bunch of times. Okay, I don't think he's gonna claim to have all of the answers, uh, but he's got a lot of good stuff to share. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Mark Morin. I would challenge you to move a whole bunch closer. Based on the metaphors, we could build a huge fire and sit way back, or we could actually sit real close and have a nice intimate fire. So I didn't want to use a microphone because I didn't want to shout to the whole room with, with that amplification. So if you're having trouble hearing me, come, come on up. Come on up and move closer. Slight challenge. Have a public moment. There you go. Move your body. Who here has sat around a campfire? All of you? Um, you know that thing where the smoke starts to blow in your eyes? Yeah. Or, or the other people's eyes, I should say? And uh, they are like, uh, uh, uh. And you're thinking, get up and move your body. <laughs> and that's not one of their resources? Move your body. Move your body. Move your body. We created this little chant. Um, with my daughter when she was real, real little. You know, when the smoke would start to blow on her, instead of fixing the fire, I'd say, move your body, move your body. <laughs> Join me, would you please? Move your body, move your body, move your body, move your body. So you can use that, just quote me. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, you'll use it for 50 years because people still need to learn that. <laughs> um, I'm happy to be here. I've had uh, a lot of great conversations already and uh, this is like, you're like my people. You know, I go to a lot of places to talk and I might have 50% jaded, cynical, you know, wondering why I want to talk about nature and how I can profit from that or not. Um, you know, you're the expert and all this kind of stuff. So I'm not wanting to bring any of that in here other than uh, we're family. And uh, there, I've already talked to a handful of people who would be better speakers than me right now who are in your room and have incredible stories, so uh, you have genius here. I think maybe one thing I might offer is that I've stepped outside the environmental ed world years ago, but I do have origins in it with the outdoor leadership program at Greenfield Community College, if anyone's familiar with that. Nine month immersion. And uh, you know, my work really is about trying to expand our systems view of what is nature. Because I'm looking for solutions that are long-term and not just sustainable, but regenerative. And that's, that's a word I think you should dig into. If you haven't really compared the two, I highly encourage you. Who's, who's dug into that comparison? Oh, okay, yeah, that is an assignment. I don't like school assignments, but that's an assignment. What is regenerative? And why would I be um, talking about that as the highest bar. And we'll, we'll come back to that hopefully. If I don't, ask me. Uh, so, watershed, watershed moments. Who looked that up on the internet? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> Nobody? Okay. Um, I did because I'm the keynote speaker, so I thought, I better know what that means. And there's, you know, not a lot of people actually know what that means. Uh, we know what a watershed is, but what's a watershed moment? I thought, you know, I, I don't want to pretend like I know. So I looked it up, and it turns out it's actually not the watershed, it's the divide. Yeah, who's seen the map of the United States with all of the rivers mapped on there? 
That's phenomenal, isn't it? Like it's like one big watershed with all these different colors on there. But a watershed moment is the divide at the top of the watershed. You understand how that works, right? Like I don't want to assume this, but like water goes to the highest point, right? And it all comes down into these low basins and slowly works its way to the ocean. So there are some points where there is no water. The very, very, very top. And that's a watershed moment where you scratch your head and you say, what moment, what choice am I gonna make? This watershed or that watershed? That's a watershed moment. And so I think perhaps what we're looking at is what is our most original, highest level, big picture choice we could make that sends us down a whole cascade in one direction or the other? Because once you're in there, you're in a paradigm. Because like, who has struggled with being inside institutions? You know, trying new things, pushing things around, going backwards, going forwards, going sideways, but you're still inside the institution. Or being outside of institutions and being in a totally different culture. You can do lots of things, but you're still inside that culture. So in terms of conscious choice, we're gonna see if we can get up to a watershed pinnacle here in the conversation. It'll be a stretch. Content is deep down in the watershed. So the other thing that's on our tag here is connecting to our natural world. And I would say that's one of the core words that I draw from is connection. And I see that distinct from information. And I see it as distinct from education. And uh, I also see our natural world as more than just the natural world. What is nature, exactly? Is it other? What is that world, exactly? And if we want to affect relationship with the natural world, what does that mean? So anytime we can create a more complex understanding of a whole, the more interrelatedness is in our choice making. Does that make sense? A more complex view of nature might be, I'm nature. I'm a species. I'm an animal. I'm an animal. <laughs> You're an animal. <laughs> what kind of animal are you? We're not going there. But that's true at a certain level, isn't it? If we go up to the up to the divide, human beings are nature, true or not. And if we're going to get to know nature, introduce people to nature, why would we exclude getting to know people as part of that process? How are they like this? in everything you do. And that's where I like to go. And so I work with a triad, just a little more complex. You can go up to five or six or seven or eight terms in a framework, introducing complexity. It just gets harder and harder to hold that in your mind with conscious choice. But three takes it out of the duality and you can consider nature, culture, and leadership as a triad. This is what I like to use. And in the center, maybe we would call it regenerative living, regenerative systems change. You have to have all three of those going. You pluck one of those out and something isn't regenerating. So um, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but first what I'd like to do is talk about routines of connection. And we're going to start with one. So there's somebody nearby you, acknowledge them. Who's nearby you? Acknowledge them. What I want you to do is um, scooch up next to that person and just take a minute. And you've had a lot. You've had a lot here the last couple of days. Some of you just arrived. Some of you been here for a couple of days. Some of you got to go out into the night or early in the morning or out on the water. Learn. Just be at peace because you're not working. So there's a lot to be thankful for. 
And there's a connection routine there called gratitude. So share with the other person something that you're thankful for. You know, something that supports your life, that nourishes you to be here, that allows you to have this blessed experience. And then the other person share. Take like a minute or so each. And if you can give context, even the better. Ready to go. So you've, you've gone vertical. Do you not want it vertical? Well, I think the horizontal is maybe really Sure. Hard. Anyone know? I think you're sure. going to use this as a balancing thing or no? Um, Does that help keep it stable? It was, I think it was just a little close. Yeah. Yeah. I have zip ties in the car. I forgot about them because you could just go like this. You were doing. You were standing it up, right? No, yeah. he wants it the other. Oh, he wants it this way. Let's see here. This row. Let me see here. Which way can we? I can rotate. I can't rotate it this way. I'm trying to get it to this part here, but if it's right here, and what's that? What is it? Someone have a here. Hold on. Hold on. And now I got my shoelaces half untied. I was just doing a nap time over the library. Okay. What's that? Is it okay? I'm just wondering if he wants it mobile in case he moves. Uh, well, you can, you can. Yeah, you can just pick it up. Let's see here. Um, you know what? Let's put it. Okay, switch if you haven't switched. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. Ah, right here. Anybody not ready? Is that what's that look like? Does that look okay? It's gonna be too low. Too low? Well, we can raise the tripod. Uh, if we put it here. Too many cooks? <laughs> okay, come on back. Make it a square knot. Yep, you got it. You can hear me like this. I never do that. <laughs> so I was at a software company recently, and uh, this is like fast forward 30 years. And my goal from the COO, the chief of operations, is to make the managers more curious. They're not curious. And I see that as a fundamental human attribute, curiosity. So what, how does that happen? And I think it's tied to learning and how we've learned. No, whichever way you want, just doing it that way. That there are certain cultures of learning that is about getting the right answers and looking good. Anyone have an educational experience like that? So curiosity, unfortunately, runs across the grain of that style of learning. Because to be curious, you have to openly admit something a little risky, which is? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, you're really good at that. <laughs> that, was the, that was the correct answer. I don't know. And so and when we get to looking at human development, how we develop as a person, culture is profoundly impactful. So one thing I wanted to say today is that information doesn't make a difference. 
It just doesn't make a difference in, let's say, behavior change. There's a big meme that says, as long as if people just knew, they would make different choices. Raise your hand if you believe that's true. Okay. All right. A couple of hands gone up. Prove me right or prove me wrong. I'm up. I'm up for that, right? And of course it depends. But I'm being challenging because we're at the top of the watershed here. We're not deep down in the trenches. But let that bother you a little bit. Information doesn't make a difference. We've got a lot of research rolling out every day. I love those studies that come out to say, um, children perform better in school when they have nature time. Children are happier when they go outside. Play is good for children. Who is that enlightening for? Why are we spending money on that? Why do we need more research that playing outside is good for kids? Does, and does that make a difference? I think they're playing outside a whole lot less. I think someone's making some money off that research. That's what I think, because it's their job. But it's not making a difference in the culture. That's what I'm challenging here. And you can look at your own work and see what makes a difference, what doesn't make a difference in behavior change, and how are you measuring that? How are you getting feedback on that? So in the software company, you could say, we, you know, if this company, our value on the wall is, is curiosity is important and good. So that's what we are. We're a curious company. So is that going to help people face the unknown and ask dumb questions? It's on the wall. There's the information. That's who we are. Depends on the culture. Depends on the community. Depends on who else is taking risks. Is this a risk-oriented, you know, in terms of questions, community? Looking stupid, playing games, having fun, being open, exploring. How do you know? And so um, apparently there was some feedback that the managers were optimizing for their department and not the other people's departments. And they weren't curious about how their work was affecting other people's work because their measures were in their box, very performance oriented. And the COO realized she was hiring for performance. She hired high performance individuals and it came with this downside, optimizing for themselves. So she's like, uh-oh, we need to change things. So she hired me to help managers become more curious and really other oriented. That's a bigger battle than you think because I can't just give them information. So I <coughs> wanted to bring in nature and nature activities as the vehicle for that. Great <laughs> for me. <laughs> so I said, well, we have to do uh, a day outside and uh, a retreat off-site because the building is going to reinforce their sense of what the culture is. We gotta get break out of that box and hopefully explore something very different with their non-work clothes on, their non-identity, work identity on, and be human beings. In fact, bring yourself as a parent, bring yourself as a friend, bring yourself as a human being to this training because all human beings are part of nature. It's our home. That is the bottom line. And if we haven't really learned that, that could help us regain one of these core human attributes called curiosity. So I set the whole thing up. You know, the purpose of being here is to increase your capacity to be curious and develop your employees to be curious. You actually have to be thinking about their level of curiosity, not just yours. What's your impact on others and their impact on others? So we're kind of stretching their imagination way out there. I wanted them to gain this, this systems effect. So we uh, got outside and we're, I was walking to the activity I was gonna do, I had it all set up, and I was a little bit in automatic mode. And I wanted to disrupt myself because this is the whole point of the training. So as I was walking, I was in automatic mode, I heard something in the distance and it was a sound in the landscape that was unusual. And I was gonna ignore it because I had, was nervous about this activity I was about to do with them. And I stopped and I said, this is the point of the day. This intention that I have is gonna bring me off trail. And that's the point of the day, is to be curious and go into the unknown. So I stopped and I said, okay, 
So one of the ways to become more sensitive is to actually engage your senses. To become sensitive to other people, we actually have to activate listening, activate seeing. So let's do this. Everyone cup their ears like this. So you know this trick where it's like uh, bat radar? Right, so you can rotate your head and like close your eyes. And you, can, you can find out where my voice is using your, your bat radar. And it really helps out a ton, especially with birds. Uh, you can put your hands on. And, who are like little squeaky voices and they're like throwing it all around. You can't quite figure out where it is where you can isolate. You can kind of like up down all around, right? And so they had a good experience with that and they figured out where I was. And I said, so there's a sound on the landscape that's been going the whole time we've been talking. And it sounds like this. Go, 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 go. And they're like, oh yeah. I go, can you, can you find it? They're like, yeah, it's right over there. Like it's been going the whole time we've been talking. Which is a little bit of a tweaker, right? Because it didn't exist for them before that. <laughs> really. So what does that mean? Were their ears not working a few minutes ago? Did they take the cotton out? They were actually receiving sounds in their ear the whole time. So that curiosity that I had started to build their capacity to be present, to actually take in sound. So my behavior is an important part of the culture for them to be curious learners. Just kind of note that. And so he, I said, so if we were on a nature program, I would pursue that. It's the most interesting thing on the landscape right now. Notice there's no, nothing else like that going on. It's like mid-morning, late-morning. And so I said, generate some questions. They're like, uh, who is it? I'm like, OK, what else? Um, where is it? I'm like, OK, keep going. We're going to do this for like 10 minutes. <laughs> and they're like, oh, uh, uh, what? Is it, is it human or non-human? like, cool, that took me somewhere. Maybe it's not human. What else? Uh, if it were nature, is it bird or mammal? Okay, what else? Why is it calling? What is it trying to say? What are its food resources? Why is it here? What other species does it interact with? And it just got more and more interesting, and we didn't have one piece of information in the group. That was cool. So I was like, okay, that's the end of the activity. We're going to go over to this other one now. And we were there, we were doing this activity, and it was all about uh, what your mind focuses on and what your senses take in. So we get enculturated into seeing certain things and not seeing other things. Hearing certain things, not hearing other things. Literally, we are a product of the culture we're in. And if we're not aware of that, at the very top of the watershed, someone else can have our best interests in mind. For example, media and advertising. You know, large organizations, companies, and corporations that are mostly extractive in their intention. They don't have your children's best interest in mind. In fact, they want you, your children to consume their products that are highly extractive, like not on the sustainability scale, like below that. Marketing to your kids, building brand identity early on. More kids can identify brands than birds, right? So how do you make people aware of that frame? Because there's the content, and then there's the frame of the content. Like media literacy, really important early on. So understanding your culture and the influence of your culture on you is, is an essential part of being a change agent. If we want to establish nature connection, we got to look at that. So. We had a really interesting scenario in that game, and you know they started realizing that they, there was 35 items on the table. You know the one you lift up the blanket and you look at the items on the table? Well, they were only seeing the things that they were familiar with, not the other things, right? And so I would ask them, like, how did you know that? Like, oh, I'm a carpenter, that's why I recognize the tool. Someone like, said, well, I saw the, the cardamom spice. I'm like, well, tell me about your family. Well, my mom's a huge cook, and I'm a cook, and then on and on, on and on. It went like that. Some people could read the, the book and the title of the book and the author of the book and they focused in on it because they're a big reader. So it's not innocent. So if we're going to be 
involving people in nature, how do we culturally organize that? Where do we draw from to create a culture of nature connection? And we have a system right now in this culture called education that we're working on and educational methods. But maybe that's down a certain watershed. Maybe if we go to the top of the watershed, there might be other possibilities that we could integrate. So one of the things that's given me a whole different view on things is working with indigenous teachers. There's just that whole paradigm that we're operating in doesn't exist with the teachers that I met and how they raised their kids. It doesn't even exist. Like it was not part of the programming at all. So that gets me curious, like, well, how do they accomplish surviving? How do they accomplish teaching their kids anything? There was no classroom. And so there are these commonalities that start to unfold, but it takes a really deep listening and a humongous curiosity to lean through what the heck the whole process could possibly be. So anthropology comes in here and considering cultural elements that don't look like school as the core of what human beings need to learn. So if you look at connection as connection to self, connection to others, and connection to nature, you can see them as like a nested set of rings. So connection to nature is just as important as connection to myself. Like really knowing who I am, really have a sense of how I work, what I'm afraid of, what I'm not afraid of, what I'm attracted to, and most importantly, what my gifts are. So there's teaching stories about what is my gift? How does my gift get brought into the world? And as an adult, what's my responsibility to bring in that child's gift into the world? How do I steward that? And how does that make the world a better place? What's my role in community? What is the diversity of functions in a community that make it resilient? What roles are non-existent in my community that have been lost that make a stronger whole? What's the function of cultural elements that are led by community that I have no choice in? For example, um, initiation. So, uh, you know, I thought, when I interview people and I spend time with them and I go to ceremonies and they're sharing with me specifics about their culture, the children are deeply nature connected without any knowledge in a way, without, without a ton of information. It's literally not about naming. While that's a useful piece, being able to name things, it's not about naming. It's about relationship and this deep, deep relationship to species and beings that become like family, like a deep belonging at very, very young ages. So when you see a logging blockade in northern Canada, it's because they're protecting family. So I just really looked at that and I thought, wow, that is a warrior quality for engaging in nature connection because that's their family and they think about future generations and their decisions. You know, the seven generations quote, which is to make our decisions with those people in mind who will never know. Not third generation or second generation, but so far down the road, we actually all have them in common. You know what culture that comes from? The Haudenosaunee. Not the product company, seven generations. But the... So when I see a culture that's been around for 500 years or 1,000 years in place that co-evolved, with the natural environment, and this is the methodology they use to raise their children to steward life forces, life ways, that gets my attention. How could I integrate those things into modern education so that we have profound belonging, profound sense of, uh, uh, morality is not quite the right word, but behavior and action in alignment. And so culture is, is a big piece of how I deliver nature connection. The third piece, leadership, nature, culture, and leadership. 
is about the need to regenerate cultural systems that support deep nature connection. Because who's doing that? Who is, who is working at the cultural level outside of schools and programs? It's hard to do it outside of an economy. That's half the problem. I can't get a job in that, so I'm gonna go into another career. Well, that's one less person offering nature connection. Right? I gotta make my money back on my school loans. That's another problem in a cultural level. I can assume that each of you have made your way into positions of offering nature connection to adults and children because there's something in your heart about it. But what about all the people that also have it in their heart that can't get a job doing it? Where are they? How are they able to do that? Or how could we build that capacity in our communities? We could have 10 times the amount of people. We would not be the lone, isolated naturalist in the group of 30 people trying to point out how cool nature is while they're on their phones. It, this can be an isolating career. There is some criticism, like who reads that guy from the UK named George Monbonoy? Monbioy. How do you pronounce that? Monbioy. Monbioy. Who reads that guy? All right, another one, put that in your notebook. He, he, he says that we live in a culture of isolation. There's a lot of design that separates us. So nature connection for me is actually a group experience, not an individual one. If we could find our sense of belonging as a group in nature connection, we start to get several things going at once. We long for community as people. We long to be heard and seen and understood and to contribute benefit to other people. And if something in our watershed is not fulfilling that, we need to get to the top of the divide and find out why and what we can do to get outside that box. Because if we don't do that, I kind of have a sense of where it's going. How do you change structures so that people have the time and the resources and the places to connect to self, others, and nature? So, there's another thing that comes in here around connection. Who um, saw the articles in the last couple of years around addiction that came out? Anybody? And did you see it says addiction is not what you think, right, that one? And when you look into it, it busts up this mythology around addiction is the chemistry inside the drugs. So we need to have a war on drugs. That was the message. It's, it's heroin, obviously. That is the issue. Right? It's the chemistry in the heroin, if you didn't, or it's the chemistry in the nicotine. Well, as a lot of science goes, some curious person goes against the grain of that and actually discovers something totally opposite. And then we have a worldview shift and we never look back. But that was a tough one because the peer scientists were like, you're crazy for researching that. And they started to get this you know, cultural oppression inside science. Don't research things that you know, are stupid or out of you know, the norm. That happens. You're not gonna get funding for that. You know who funds research? Who funds research? It's a pretty tight loop. We really want learning, and we really want learning that teaches about culture. It's an unpopular thing to fund because it eventually teaches you about how the whole system works. And what we wanna do is, is understand how the system works and then build the capacity for human beings to thrive the way we're supposed to. So understanding human development is an essential part of being a nature educator. Understanding how culture works, how original human beings build profound nature connection wisdom is an essential part of being a nature educator. And bridging to modern people and knowing you're bridging to modern people is an essential attribute too. I just really want to stir that. That's, that, that's up here at the pinnacle. So what they discovered with addiction is that, actually, this goes back to the 70s, to Bruce Alexander, who started looking at um, rat studies. Put a rat in a cage, put two water bottles, one of them has heroin in it, one's just plain drinking water. Rat in the cage, tastes both of them after a while, and eventually just keeps going to the heroin, gets addicted on it, and dies. See, proves our point. Heroin's addicting. A lot of people didn't look at that for a long time. They just referenced it. Then 
more research was coming out around the fringes, and he re-explored it, and he's, he said, you know, and some other people got involved, they said, you know, um, that's not how rats live, by themselves in a cage. <laughs> How, who's that no duh for? Raise your hand that you're like, no duh, right? But we didn't question it either. So intelligence is just not correlated with culture a lot of the time. You know, it's how we can get a president elected. <laughs> right? It, you really gotta work on this. It's like media literacy. You really have to keep stepping back and keep examining how did we get here? Who's pulling these dials and for what purpose? Because we have an agenda. We, nature educators, have an agenda. What is it? You know? I'm sure you, you could articulate it in one sentence. Why do you do what you do, really? You know, we didn't need nature education in the past. It wasn't a need. Why? What? It just happened. Because why? It just happened. It just happened. We were doing fine. <laughs> so and then as so, soon as something starts to decline, education for that thing starts to grow. So you'll notice that things just start to rise and it's not because it's a cool new thing, it's because it's starving to death somewhere. We haven't needed to use the word mentoring in the past. If you look at like when words were born, it just pops up in modern modernity. So mentoring is like because we don't have that level of relationship education anymore. Anyhow, <clears throat> so what they discovered is that if you built a rat environment that's based on how rat the animal, not rat the subject test thing, works, it's a social animal, it likes a lot of stimulus, you know, has tons of things going on in its life, so they made a really big rat park, like amusement park for rats. And I, I know you don't hear rats in the wrong way, but other audiences I would tell this to, they're like, every time I say rat, they go, Ugh. I'm not talking like dirty, city, gross rat that's you know, going through your cupboards, right? I'm talking about the animal, right? The rodent. You can picture this, right? I mean, if you put a chipmunk in a cage by itself, the, I mean, that could kill it alone without the heroin on it. <laughs> but somehow we did that to rats. Anyhow, it's an, it's an expression of our own thinking that we would put our, a single rat in a small box and not examine the box. That's this box. It's called colonization of the mind. So they built a big rat park and they put in 20 rats and they just figured out what a good equation would be for males and females and the whole thing. And all the stimulus is going on in there and the same two bottles. Test one, test there. They all studied them all. They all had a chance to test them all. And after a while, which one do they prefer? What? Take a risk. Shout it out. One, two, three. Because you know I'm telling the story for a reason. <laughs> the regular water. Wait, but heroin's addicting. If they tried both, they wouldn't be able to stop. You're thinking about this? You're raising your hand? Yeah. You just have to grok that. I mean, this is, you, this is really important to grok because I'm really talking about what right now in this narrative? People. I am. I'm talking about people. And there's more ways to be addicted besides heroin. That's just kind of the finger pointed one. But what else can we be addicted to as people? Chocolate. But real, <laughs> but like real addiction issues in our current society. Technology. What else? Power, yeah, food, what? Money. Money, yeah. Gambling, sex. There's a lot of vehicles for it, but it's not the thing. The research is saying it's what human beings need to thrive is missing. We live in a culture of isolation starts to have some evidence for it. We're backing our way into that realization. So you could spend all day long trying to work them off of heroin into methadone into the other thing, but that's not what they need. What do human beings need? This is, this is the big question. What? 
A good life. So, you know, that's, that's a long conversation. What does that look like? And are you providing that as part of your nature education programs? Ultimately. <laughs> because they're, in, they're interlocked. You can't separate the two. If you're only focused on nature, edu nature education in school groups one hour a week and you never see them again, you're not actually going to achieve your goal, unfortunately. We live in a complex time and we need complex understanding of the world. I think there's room for doing what we're doing, but it can't be the box. There has to be this awareness of how we got here. And in the larger systems of culture, cultural isolation, we're building lots of addictive patterns for people. So connection can be, in some disturbing way, be achieved through a drug fix, to, you know, try to get some kind of connection. It could be through hurting people. You know, I get feedback from the law when I hurt somebody. That's how I get connection. If you look at uh, people who've, they said in, in Vietnam, there was like 20% of the people were addicted to heroin over there as a way of coping. And when they got back, less than 1% were addicted to heroin when they re-entered their lives. No programming. Zero programming. That people who are in medical situations um, have to have an equivalent to very, very pure high-grade heroin or, or cocaine-type substances, opioids. And after they go through the whole healing process and they move back into their families, they have no desire to, to continue. Gabor Mate, write that name down. Phenomenal person weaving all this together. But if you go to Connecticut and you look at a research of, of Wall Street folks, the rate of opioids and alcoholism is off the charts across other counties. There's 300 AA meetings a day in certain counties in Southern Connecticut. 300 a day. Because they're busy, they're full. So <clears throat> that just shows that you know a privileged life isn't actually mean you're connected, right? So I think the experience of nature connection can have profound results basically on a healing level for people, not just an intellectual information level. And I, I would encourage you to keep that in mind while you're doing your work. That it could be just as important when you're going out with the kids to just let them free play. Drop your agenda. A frog hops across the path and you're heading towards this activity over here, follow the frog. <laughs> could be the best thing that happened to them. So, there's a lot of things that we could talk about here in terms of culture. Um, human development, I mentioned, is an important part of leadership because I'm looking for something called regenerative leadership. Sustainable could be called sustaining it the way it is. We're able to sustain it the way it is. That takes a certain capacity to, to not keep sliding downhill. That would be sustainable. But if we're behind the eight ball and we're at 450 parts per million or whatever the number is, hanging out there actually is not gonna work. Right? Not taking on any more carbon projects. We still have a, a, quite a few issues, right? We actually have to go the other direction and build capacity for being like nature 100% as people. That's regenerative. It's a different paradigm for doing work in the world. It's evolving the capacity for human beings to thrive like nature. You could say it's like the difference between teaching information and mentoring the gifts out of young people. You could give them information about what tree the name of this tree is, or you could help them learn by asking them questions. It's not about the answer, it's about their ability to use their observation skills and their critical thinking. Maybe you give them the answer, maybe you don't, it doesn't really matter. It's really about getting them engaged in who they are and what they're attracted to. 
that's having your eye on the right ball. Information gets useful every once in a while when you kind of get this kind of satiation. It's like, yeah, it's this. What about these other questions? Right? Let's keep going. What other, what other things can we learn? So one of the uh, kind of little frameworks I like to use is around initiation. This is a cultural term that human beings in, in cultures around the world and in my ancestry have had initiatory experiences. It's like a critical part of human development. As we're evolving our identity as little children underneath the domain of our parents, eventually start to individuate into who am I? And there is some threshold moments that are critical that have always throughout human history had socialization from others involved in that process. People who have that young person's best interest in mind for the good of the whole. Aunts, uncles, grandmothers, grandparents. In fact, parents were less involved at that point because they had this big bias. I don't want them to experience any discomfort. But the aunts and uncles are finally back. <laughs> well, that's okay. Well, skin your knees. So what? Get out. <laughs> what do you think? Who are you? Right? And so there's something about that experience that maybe if you're on the older side of this room, that culture had some self-initiatory aspects to them. I had a great conversation with Eric recently about being a young naturalist and exploring ditches that were too high to get out of. And you're like, uh-oh. I'm far from home. It's before cell phones. No one knows I'm here. How do I get out of this ditch? And for an hour, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> and he didn't die. He's here. <laughs> but he built the capacity, right? He built to, to believe in himself and figure out how to get out of the thing. It was more than just getting out of a hole. Because he probably jumped into that hole from then on. Because I know how to get out. But the reverse today with parenting could look like overprotecting Helicopter parenting, less, less edge experiences. And ironically, it's having a backwards effect. The kids are not connecting to who they are. They're not building any capabilities. My daughter is 17, and I was engaged in this art of mentoring methodology for about 10 years before she was born. So as a parent, I've been blessed to look at parenting as a developmental journey and as a mentor with that kind of consciousness, always really asking, where is she at? What is she growing into? What is she developing in her humanity? And uh, we were at Smith College, because we're looking at colleges, going through the interview. And she's interested in early childhood education because she's been hanging out, of course, with her peers the last couple of years, and she has a lot of criticisms about how her friends are being parented. Like, she has a paradigm where she's like, I, I think their parenting is terrible. I mean, my, my friends are so lame. <laughs> they have no will. Like, when something difficult happens, I'm the only one like, well, we can get around that. Let's figure something out. And they're like, no. Can't. She's like, what's with you guys? But she's aware that it's a system. It's a product of her uprising, her upraising. And so uh, she's like, I want to go into early childhood education and disrupt it with a kind of uh, cultural mentoring that, that creates conscious parenting and in a community where rites of passage is the norm. And it's very land-based and it's very oriented around what human beings need to survive and thrive. Like indigenous means modern education or something. She's integrating. So we're, she's, she's, the guy comes over to doing the tour who's a senior in college and she looks like a Smith student, if you can picture her. And, uh, She's like, yeah, I'm interested in early childhood education. And the girl says, oh, so am I. I actually took some courses in that at a, at a school. I think it was like a Montessori. It's great. The kids get to explore all sorts of stuff. And like, you know, I saw a five-year-old using sharp knives. And I have, I was not comfortable using a sharp knife. I was like 13. I was terrified of them. And I, I kind of shoot a glance over at Lucia, and she's like, right, 13, right? Because Lucia had sharp knives, played with fire, climbed trees, collected edible plants, you know? Because it was a connection journey with the natural world and with her competencies, you know? 
And what that does for a human being to meet them where they're at with competencies is an immeasurable stacked benefit 10 years down the road. It's, at, it's, it's night and day. <clears throat> and I think older generation people might criticize younger generation people thinking them as an isolated thing instead of a product of the culture. Say, God, they're, they're just like so lame, right? They're not competent. They don't carry around a knife, you know? They don't have a sense of how to navigate the world. You know, where's their duress? Not everybody, but that's kind of a theme out there. So it's possible to use the, the word initiation as a lens. Not like, you know, tying to a tree with honey and ants, but <laughs> let's, call it, let's call it edge experiences. Let's call them edge experiences that are facilitated by you, little ones that bring them into connection over that threshold of, I'm afraid to step off the trail. I'm afraid to touch the bug. I'm afraid to sit down on the ground. I'm afraid to go out at night. I'm afraid to taste this plant. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. You may be the child's introduction to the world like Helen Keller. This is water, this is the sign for water and language starts to unfold for Helen Keller at an adolescent age. She realizes, holy cow. Her second word, her second thing she wants to know is, who is this thing teaching me that? What's this? She says, Anne Sullivan. Anne. And then, her, you know what her third question was? What's this? And Anne says, Helen, he gives her the sign. That's what the journey of nature connection is like, right there. There is a veil that you can bring people through, a connection. And it's gonna take a little risk. Cold, wet, hungry, buggy, alone, dark. Those are the seven rites of passages of nature connection. If you haven't been through those yourself, that's a good place to start. And do it with other people. Go into those things. They will translate the fearlessness and will and unstoppableness for you and for others. It will translate. The cultural approach to nature connection. And it'll develop the will of the leadership to say, I can do this for other people. It's regenerative. So, The other thing I would say is that, so we did a core routine in the beginning of nature connection and personal connection, which is gratitude. You find gratitude in cultures all over the world. Is it a part of your nature connection programs? It's, it's hard to find a culture that doesn't have gratitude in 10 different ways. It actually bypasses and goes to some a whole other location for guidance, gratitude. As soon as you put the mind focus on what you're thankful for, you have a totally different relationship to your surroundings. It can be an inventory every day. What am I thankful for in nature? What am I thankful for in my family? There is you know, a lot of support that's got this group of people in this room that other people don't have. Second one is the art of questioning. Asking open-ended questions to build the curiosity, build the capacity of the listener. Questioning. Without knowing where it goes, because you're gonna have to really give up knowing how it turns out. The open-ended question. There's no solution. It teaches them to hang out in the unknown. Maybe you get back to them in a week. Maybe you give them some opportunities for research. Another routine. The sit spot, a place on the land that you always go nearby your home. Rooftop, just outside your door, porch, backyard, the ditch next to your yard, unmanicured is good, and hang out there. Be in your senses. Core routine of nature connection, sensory connection. How do you know you're listening? 
How do you know you see what you see? What are you not seeing? The sound over there, the coffee maker, been going the whole time. The birds in the distance, the taste of the plants that are coming up in the springtime, actually looking at buds evolving into leaves. Hang on, don't move, they're still moving. They're moving the cycle of the moon. What phase are we in? These kinds of things. The sit spot is an anchor place in the land as I am nature in this place. And then journaling. It creates kind of an observer on yourself. Am I learning? What am I learning? How, I, how have I been regenerative today in my leadership? What cultural elements am I a part of today and which ones am I facilitating? What connection routines did I participate in or mentor into other groups of people today? What edges have I experienced? What unknowns? What's my capacity for discomfort today? All that plays into our ability to make a difference in the missions that we have around nature education. So those are a good set of tools and things. Um, I think I'm gonna wrap up here. We're kind of getting close to a, a transition time. Um, and I have two potential things I could do that might take about 10 minutes. One of them is a story about a possum, and the other is a song. What do you think? Awesome. I wasn't giving you a choice. I was saying, <laughs> think both of those. Okay, so I'm going to possum. Okay, so here's a cultural thing. See, the thing is, is like when you look at culture, you, you don't know what the thing is that makes a human being a human being. When you look, when there's no school, what's the thing? Is it awareness of the four directions? Is it having an aunt in your life or a grandmother? Was it the rite of passage? Was it you know being able to travel in the landscape with no map? Is it eating edible plants? Is it being a tracker? What is it? You don't know. So you gotta include them all. So one of these elements that's common in nature-based cultures is awareness of ancestors. Connection to ancestors. And the more I spend time thinking about like how could I possibly bring that into nature connection, I start to think about legacy. Because if you're acknowledging ancestors, like I've done with my daughter her whole life, and Ancestor Feast is coming up early November. At some point, I'll be an ancestor. I will be dead. And the meaningfulness of everything that happened up until then will change for her. So we're working that direction while we're working the other one. Acknowledging grandmothers who've passed, and the foods that they made, the love that they shared with us, animals that we've known. So don't disregard the concept of ancestors. Think about how connection to your ancestry could actually provide a stability for you. Like I am not a cultural orphan. I belong. There are people in my lineage who've helped me get to where I am. And it might also help you understand people who have an ancestry on this land. Who are the original peoples from this land whose ancestors are buried under our feet? Acknowledging those ancestors on a regular basis, like they're a living thing, is how a native would relate to their place. They, they, the ancestors are in the soil and are in the trees, they're in the air, literally. So it's a very blurred sense of past and present. Who am I? I am nature. I am the ancestors. So uh, my daughter's grandmother died when she was little and died of a heart attack. She was from South America, living in the States for a long time, but she was culturally Colombian and uh, so we were in the grieving period of that. And so one of the traditions we did was before we uh, started our meal, we put a little food on a plate to acknowledge uh, the grandmother who would be sitting at our table. 
you know, but instead of leaving it at an empty chair, we would put it outside. And uh, we were doing that for a while <clears throat> during that period of time. Also what was going on is we were getting to know the local animals during her childhood, including a local possum. And the local possum uh, would go into dormancy and then wake up on a warm winter day and, and walk across the snow and had that kind of weird thumb thing going on, you know? And I was like, oh, this is a good thing. Like, let's track this for a while. Like, what is that? Like, I don't know, look at that thumb, you know? We're talking about it and, and back trailing it to find out where it came from and finding the muddy tracks. I said, when you find the muddy tracks, you're close, right? The muddy tracks end up in like a ditch somewhere, you know, a hole in the ground in the wintertime. So we had a lot of fun getting to know this possum and its tracks. It would eat the bird seed that was falling out of the bird feeder and eat these weird poops. And, um, and then one day, um, uh, we were putting out a plate outside the door and it was nighttime and we're eating and we hear this kind of sound of like, kind of sound is kind of like, that did sound like a person, you know? And we, and we, it's ancestor time of year, right? We go over and we look out the window and no one's there. Oh. Like this. And I, and I look and this possum is, is eating that food out of the plate. The ancestor food for the grandma. You're know? like, oh my God, look at that. It screws away. Later on, not that much long ago, because I, she made this connection. I don't know, maybe she was like five or six years old. Um, she called, you know, my, my wife called me up and said, you gotta come back really, you gotta come back home from work. It's, it's, I know it's the middle of the day, but you gotta come home. There's a possum in the driveway. Lucia thinks it's the possum. And our friend possum is what she calls it. She thinks it's our friend possum. And it's, it's weird, it's like circling. It's just circling. And it's just like circling in a really small circle. We're really upset. And so, I, left work and I came home and by the time I got in the driveway it was like in the compost bin which had an open side and it's just circling in there, circling in there. And we were just like, whoa, what's going on? You know, this just doesn't feel right. And then it circled out of the bin and circled down the little slope and there's a little creek at the bottom of the slope, like three feet. It's going through the thicker grass down the slope and it's like going to the water and it goes to put its head in the water and goes in the water and comes out of the water, maybe because it wants to drink the water, but it keeps circling, right? And then it gets up on the bank and then down in the water and then up in the bank and its foot starts to get wound up in the tall grass. The one foot that's pivoting. And it pivots and it pivots and then it's having struggle getting up and then one more time and it goes down into the water and literally drowns right in front of us. And we're having this somewhat like death and life, nature, holy moment. Because we know this animal. And we're, we just start grieving. And at different levels for each of us. And we eventually buried Possum. But as we were heading back into the home, Lucia says, well, I guess Possum's gonna eat on the other side of the ancestor plate now. <laughs> So there's like a continuum there, right? So that's the possum story. <clears throat> how ancestors relate to nature connection. <clears throat> so will you sing along with me? Yeah. Of course. I'm gonna take a risk. I'm gonna sing in front of people. <laughs> I'm not really a singer or a guitar player, but who here is like a comfortable singer? Um, and can harmonize, like pretty. Can, can you come up, the three of you, just raise your hand? Ah, uh, you raise your hand, come on. You said you are a singer. So, you're just gonna chill till we get to the chorus. Okay. Okay. But harmonizing will be really sweet. Oh, all men. Where's the ladies? There's definitely ladies. Oh, this is good, this is good. We'll take it, we'll take it. It's sexy. <laughs> so, um, this is a preview for this evening. We'll uh, see if we can get this going here. So, who knows uh, who Nako Bear is? Oh, the young people? You look like Nako Bear. Who's Nako Bear? <laughs> So 
the chorus, we always do the chorus first, right, you teach, is um, Aloha Keakua. And Aloha in, in the language is complex and has many, many meanings that are, you know, need context. But one way of thinking of Aloha is, is the ha, which is the breath, go right? And Aloha can mean we share the same breath. Imagine that as a greeting cup. Like, matter who you are, I know you, I don't know you, like we say Aloha. We share the same breath, and you can do the forehead thing, right? Imagine that. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Greeting custom. Super powerful. Mm -hmm. So, aloha, keakua. And aloha can be translated as love, connection. So, God is love, keakua is like God, if that's even like a proper translation. And then the other word is kuleana, which is loosely translates to responsibility. And the way I read into it is that, you know, it's, it's taking responsibility for the gifts that you've been given, which include who I am in this world, the unique essence that I was born to be, and move that into the community because the community needs that to survive. Kuliana, responsibility, taking care of others through that way. <clears throat> so. Aloha, aloha, keakua, keakua, aloha, aloha, keakua, keakua. I give thanks, I give thanks. Each day that I wake, I give thanks, I give thanks. And the new line. Each day that I wake, I will praise, I will praise. Each day that I wake, I will praise. Come in the likeness in the image of God Cause you can be like that All that humbleness and all that respect Aloha, aloha Keakua, keakua Aloha, aloha Kuleana, kuleana and transcend this holy makeup I am capable I am powerful and the day that I don't wake up and transcend this holy makeup I am on my way to a different place Aloha Each day that I wake, 
I will praise, I will praise each day that I wake. I will praise, I will praise each day that I wake. I give thanks, I give thanks each day that I wake. I give thanks. doing a workshop right after this, eating acorns. <laughs> you want to eat acorns with me? Right. Yes, sir. Um, you're, when you're talking about addictions and, and across the entire spectrum, I, I was just thinking that um, almost every one of them could be traced back to a, to a simple thread of um, someone having something that's stressful in their lives, and like the rats in the cage.